All right, ETM Hotep. Hopefully, um, my audio is fine. I want to welcome everyone to uh, Seshu Ma'ani Medonetcher YouTube channel. Tonight, we normally have a Freestyle Fridays where we uh, select a picture of you know any committee or in Egyptian description, and then we proceed to actually transliterate and translate it. Uh, freestyle, what we call freestyle, which is without any any aid of any books which it will be the sign list or the dictionaries, all right? So we've been doing that for a little over a year now. I would say it was pretty much a little over a year. And um, and we do that, one, because it's fun, and then two, because it, it allows us to self-check, um, check ourselves and see how proficient we are at uh, memorizing different words, recognizing different glyphs in isolation, and recognizing the glyphs that pattern that go together as words and their meanings all right um, it also allows us to get used to certain redundancies that we see within the uh, literature of ancient Kemet uh, for example the formulas what we call formulas we have the offering formula formulas we have um, what we would consider quotation formulas which is um, Jed Medu in or Jed Medu which is a uh, somebody says something uh, those are examples of some formulas so doing these exercises allows us to you know recognize that and actually see how far we've come you know in our studies and see how far we have to go all right um but this freestyle friday just want to kind of um have a lightweight conversation about uh well the title of this hangout is the question are we stuck and so i just wanted to have a lightweight conversation discussion about that question and the question by are we stuck what i mean is uh stuck in terms of a a um almost like a broken record you know how a scratch record it'll play and then it'll play a certain part of the song and then it'll clip and it'll go back to the beginning of that part of the song and it'll keep going over and over again so are we in this vicious loop where we're stuck and we're not making progress. So that's what I mean by the question, are we stuck? All right. And um, before we move forward in that discussion, I'll just introduce myself, um, Reni Wujau. Um, well, Wujau may not be my but uh, everyone could call me Wujau. And that's Wujau or Wujau. Uh, some people, uh, you know, get my name mixed up a little bit. Um, and that's me. So I'll be running point for the conversation. Uh, also, uh, the members of the Seshu Mindy Meta Nature are on board on the panel. So maybe you can unmute yourself and introduce yourselves real quick. Hotep, Ren E, Imiket. And um, yes, looking forward to the discussion. Hotep. ETM Hotep, welcome in peace, everybody. Ren E. June. My name is June. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoy the show and leave with satisfaction. Hotep. All right. And also, um, we made it a custom to actually recite the offering formula uh, when we start off our hangouts. And the few times that we that we deviated from that was because the inscriptions that we were working on were actually offering formulas themselves. So we we pretty much felt that there's no need to recite the formula and then work on the formula um, during the hangout session. So um, in this case, I'll just recite it because we've been doing this for, like I said, over a year. And you can look at the archives to um, look at the formula. What we recite is, is pretty much a generic formula, offering formula. And we do so to uh, one, get used to it and the different structures of the formula. And by now, so we, we've been doing it for over a year. So by now, any of you all who have been doing it with us, hopefully you've caught on to the basic structure of the formula and the actual vocabulary within the formula and things like that. So we, um, we want to um, recite it. So um, Sona Emiket, if you would like to, uh, by all means, Uh, 
All right, um, Dua. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, recite the offering formula. Hotep Dinesu, Wesir Neb Jadu, Nature R, Neb Abju, DF Beret Keru, T Henket, Ka Apet, Shes Menket, Ket Nebet Neferet, Wabet Anket, Nature Im, In Kani Imahu, Ahu, Makiru. And what he says is um, the, an offering the king gives Osiris, Lord of Jadu, Great God, Lord of Abydos, so that he may give verbal offerings of beer, bread, ox, fowl, alabaster, and linen, everything good and pure on which a God lives, for the car of the revered ones, the ancestors justified. Okay, okay, excellent. And so, like I said, by now, everyone who's been um, tuned in to our shows and uh, even our Facebook group, uh, Seshu Maani Ma Metanetra Facebook group. Uh, you should definitely be used to that by now, because we've def we've been driving it into the ground, you know, with the offering formula. Um, that's a very prolific uh, set of words that's found all throughout Kemet, as far as the different locations within Kemet and the different eras of time. All right, that formula is pretty much stationary. All right, so it's a good thing to uh, memorize and to utilize. All right, it's just something routine that that we do, and we actually uh, borrowed that idea of doing that from Dr. Raketi Amin, who also does that in the beginning of her um, teaching sessions. All right, so uh, yeah, do I, Dr. Raketi Amin, for um, introducing that? So. All right, so now we uh, we have another uh, member. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself before we dive into the conversation. To you. Otep, Ebit, Renishan, thanks for tuning in. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the show. All right. So, um, like I said, I just wanted we well, I just wanted to have a lightweight discussion about the question, are we stuck? And again, what I mean by stuck is stagnant. Are we are we, you know, stuck in cement? Are we cemented in 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 the same thing, doing the same thing over and over and over again and not making progress? All right. And um and where that question comes from, what what makes me ask that question is um well i've been a member of facebook since 2009 that's when i think i first signed up for facebook in 2009 so here we are in 2017 so that's eight years ago so i've been a, a registered user of facebook for eight years and so what i did recently is i went back through my timeline you know on facebook you can you can look at your activity log if you you know if for those who don't know this you can go to your home you could go to your your own page and then go to your activity log and then on the right hand side you'll see the different years or however long you've been signed up for facebook it'll allow you to go backwards in time and see the different things that you posted on your timeline and and if, if people tag you in notes and things like that and um and also you can download your entire history from facebook there's a there's an option to do that as well. Well, anyway, I've done that, and so I was just evaluating some of the some of the things that I saw and participated in from way back in 2009, so eight years ago up until today. So I just kind of perused through uh, my timeline history, and so I see the different topics that came up and some of the topics that I chimed in on and participated in in the discussions and things like that. And what I've noticed is that a lot of the topics that we see right now in 2017 are topics that have come up, you know, over the past eight years on a consistent basis. So eight years ago, some of the topics we speak about today, they were taking place back then. So then I'm looking at the difference was there any progress made from the first time I, you know, participated in a conversation on a topic versus today? 
And so I haven't seen a lot of progress. There, there, there is some progress, you know, and then at the same time, we have different users. We have different people on Facebook that will um, focus in on a topic today that they didn't that they didn't focus on eight years ago. So I understand that. So, so I'm, I'm putting all of that in, in, into the equation. So I, I definitely understand that everybody's not going to see the same information at the same time. But now when you step back in the, at the, in the bigger picture of things, the question that I feel is important, are we stuck is because once we know that different people mature, in information at different times and different people will be focused on a specific topic or a specific um, issue at different times from each other, then we know that happens. But the question becomes how, once we do know that happens, should we allow that to happen? And should we just continue to um, allow topics to resurface and the same arguments. And, and the reason why this is a little different than just a general topic coming up is because the way that social media works, especially on the different topics that we deal with, when they come up, they're not just topics that come up. They're topics that come up and are argued. They're debated. You got people who are for an issue, people who are against an issue. And so a lot of Facebook dialogues are um, argumentative. And, I, and I'm not saying that arguments are, are bad at all. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. But that's just how they are. You have different views. People have different views and people will argue their point of view. And the person who don't agree, they'll argue their point of view and so on and so forth. And that, that could be a healthy thing. So I'm not saying that it's negative. Um, but so the thing is, these topics will come up and they'll recycle, 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 recycle. And so much so that I've, I've noticed a pattern to where I don't see, when you step back and look at the bigger picture of things, I don't see very much progress being made. So are we stuck is a question of the bigger picture. What do we do about that? If topics, different variety of topics come up and are argued and you have to argue the same thing over and over again to people, and sometimes it's new people, sometimes it's the same people that you know topics will come back come up on what do we do about it or what can we do about it what are some of the suggestions that we uh need to look at in order to um fix that or come out of that broken record that 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 broken record you know when when the record is broken when a cd is skipping what's the first thing you do you eject the cd you get some alcohol or or windex or whatever and you wipe that cd off and put it back in and hope it doesn't skip again with records the same way you, you you clean it and you clean the needle off you know i mean a lot of people don't even remember turntables but turntables with the needle and the vinyl record or whatever when it skips or whatever the first thing you do is you you um dust off that needle get all all the all the uh dirt off the needle clean the record put it back on and hope it doesn't skip hope it's not an actual uh mark inside the the material of the record itself so so we know when stuff is repetitive, we, we tend to try to fix it. Like I gave an example with the CD and the record. So now here we are with our discussions. They're becoming repetitive where it's just skipping back to the beginning of that, of that conversation. And so, so we never hear the other songs being played. And we, so as an analogy, we never hear the other information that needs to be discussed because we're talking about the same things over and over and over and over again arguing over the same things over and over and over again. Things that have been uh, proven by way of evidence one way or the other, and we still discuss it over and over and over and over again. So the question is that I'm asking, and you know, y'all could chime in on the, on the panel, and I'm just gonna uh, just throw the question out there for now and then see what you all, uh, you all's thoughts are on that. But what should be done, what can be done and uh, well, first, I mean, do you all see it that way? Because it may just be me. I doubt it, but it may just be me. Maybe, maybe I'm the crazy one. <laughs> but if you all see this, then, you know, the question stands. What should we do about it or can we do about it? And again, I'm speaking about the bigger picture of our progress. So I open the floor, you know, I'm 
like I said, it's, I just want to have a discussion about this, and I'm going to see if anybody who's tuned in watching us, if you would like to um, chime in, I'll, I'll look at the, the chat, and maybe later on I'll post a link if you want to come in. Uh, but, yeah, so starting with the panel. So any, any of you all have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it could be that you just probably stuck on a different timeline. You know, everything is looping over there. But um, <laughs> no, seriously, um, I think it's, it's uh, what you're saying is on point. And uh, I remember that um, you, you at some point when you were discussing, you had a suggestion about, um, or, you know, organizing, organizing the truth. And um, you talked about having some kind of um, website or, or at least a, a place where, um, you know, all the all the facts are, are put into place, what has been discussed, what has been, you know, um, brought forth on the table with evidences and all that, um, you know, just organize that kind of information where we have um, a resource center so that um, when people come in, you know, some people might be new to, to the information and when they come in and, you know, they want to um, regurgitate or recycle some of those old claims, then we have a place where, you know, they can be uh, directed to and you know so that allows us to continue with um the works that we need to you know to be focusing on so that's just my take okay excellent um anybody else yeah i agree with uh some of the points you made there are a bunch of repetitive arguments uh going around i just think we need to uh put out a call for more aspiring scribes because what we try and do is present you know accurate information and you know spread the truth but it's you know it's it's, it's uh what is it nine nine of us or no 11 11 of us you know what i mean so it's only so much um us 11 can do i mean you know we have other people um in our facebook group that are <clears throat> studied in you know various topics but um, in some of these other groups, you just have understudied people that are understudied and uh, don't follow, you know, the proper uh, methodology with their research, and that and that's uh, a big problem, you know. So I mean, and what Sinet said, that is good to that we, you know, we have the the website, metanature.com, where we, you know, have a bunch of information and it's always being updated and added to. Um, for, you know, a resource for people. And when, when claims come up, we just shoot them the link. You know, we wrote an article on this a year ago. Check this out. Or, you know, so um, I don't know. We just need more people active spreading the correct information. Um, because, yes, yeah, some of these arguments are just redundant and uh, repetitive. So I, 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 do, I have noticed what uh, you're talking about. And I don't know. Hopefully, <laughs> we get some suggestions from people in the chat also on uh, things that we could do. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, how about you, Sean? <clears throat> I agree with everyone on the panel. Um, a resource center would be <laughs> would do a world of wonders, but then when we lead the horse to water, will they drink it? Um, because some of these people, they just refuse the information regardless. They'll listen to you, and some people will appreciate it, but who won't, for whatever reason, they're stuck in the belief. Um, I think some of this just has to do with, with our mental makeup and the, the trauma that has taken place inside of our minds that continues to dwell. So we tend to spin the globe and keep repeating this stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's every day something different. Okay, so uh, good. So I think we're all, so far we're all in agreement. And I'm looking at the chat and I believe that everybody in the chat so far is in agreement. And I wanna say shout out to everybody who's tuned in. Definitely appreciate you all taking your time out and um, you know kicking it with us on this Friday uh, night. Um, so now, because what you all are describing, describing, and, and also everyone inside the chat, we're describing something that needs to be done. Because this is the thing, uh, like I mentioned, everybody is not gonna intellectually mature at the same time. So we have to account for that, you know? So 
what has to be what's one of the suggestions that I've made and a lot of other people have made as well. And it's similar to what we're talking about, what you all have said, and I've read in the chat just now. But I think one thing that we have to um, develop or to fine tune is what's called. I'm going to uh, um, play the vocal vocalization of this word because some people may not be familiar with it. But it, but uh, let me know if you can hear this word. Pedagogy. Did y'all hear that? Two. I'll play it again. Pedagogy. Okay, pedagogy. All right. Now, pedagogy. Some people say pedagogy. A pedagogy is the method and practice of teaching. All right. And especially as an academic subject or theoretical concept. So this is a method and practice of teaching. This is what we have to develop. And so now this is for adults. Pedagogy is for uh, I'm sorry. Pedagogy is for children. Andragogy is for adults. So there's two different words for teaching children. Um, and then there's another word for teaching adults. But both of those words deal with concepts on the method and practice of teaching itself. These are the things that we have to be aware of and that we have to um, develop and tighten up. Because it's one thing, see, what, the thing that um, what's being called the conscious community and everything that comes with that, that phrase, conscious community, the conscious community is really a social community first. That's, that's what we can show evidence that it is. Because we, we can't tell who's conscious and who's not, you know, by whatever definition that people use the word conscious for. It means alert, aware, to be able to respond to something and so on and so forth. We can't tell who all is is at what level of consciousness and things like that. But one thing we definitely can tell is that we're all social. Why? Because a lot of a lot of what the conscious community does in terms of its um, activities is on social media and in face to face social events. So it's through social media that you learn about a social event that's going to take place. And then, you know, you you go to the event, participate, uh, you know, go to lectures, go to debates, go to whatever the case is. So one thing for sure is that the social the conscious community is a social community. And that's how I refer to it. I don't really use the word conscious community. But so within this social community that we have. We have people that will stand, stand, step forward and start teaching, you know, that, you know, YouTube channels, um, Facebook groups and whatever else they'll start teaching. Now, teaching is a, is a skill. And just because you know information does not mean that you can teach it. There's a lot of people that that know a lot of things and they can memorize things. They can know certain things and they themselves can get it, comprehend it, be be, you know, competent in it and, and the whole nine, but they may not have the skills in order to teach it. So this is where uh, pedagogy and andragogy comes into play because those are methods of teaching. You have to you have to gain a skill set in teaching and know how to teach, how to convey information to the next person to where they uh, understand it. And you have to be able to be flexible enough that if you teaching in one way or something and people are not getting it, you have to be able to switch it up. And the whole point is for them to get it. So, you know, that, that takes some skills, takes take some time and things like that. That's what needs to be done. But what I want to emphasize is that we have to set something up or fine tune that because people come into this knowledge at different times, just like school. Um, like you pick any ele any elementary school in your area. Um, and that's usually K through fifth grade, I believe now. Um, but whatever elementary school, just just look at any elementary school. They start off with kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then you go to junior high and high school. Now, once a class group of students fill up the kindergarten, then they pass and they go to the first grade and then they pass and go to second grade and so on and so forth. Once that kindergarten class pass all those grades, they don't close the school down. They're not done. 
Why? Because they know that there's going to be a new a new group of kindergartners the next year. And then when those kindergartners go to the first grade, then it's going to be a new group of kindergartners that's going to be just starting off. You see, so the so what we're doing is that we don't because we don't have a systematic way or an institutionalized way of of proceeding step by step through knowledge. We have people that are being are repeating, 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 repeating. So that's why we're arguing over the same things over and over again, because they're not properly taught the first time around to where that group of people that are exposed to it, then they can move on. And then when people are fresh to that information, you teach it and then they can move on. And it's like a revolving door, but it's but it's a um, purposeful revolving door. It's set up that way. And this goes into pedagogy and andragogy. These are methods of teaching and setting up an institution. So this is what we're lacking. And because of that, this is why I'm seeing what I'm seeing when I when I describe what I saw on my timeline from 2009. Eight years of Facebook, I'm seeing the same things come up, same things come up. And and really, this that's what sparked me myself to write articles because I found myself repeating the same information over again. So I started writing articles and like, like the brother June said, now I can just show, I could just give somebody the link. That way I don't have to pause the progress that I'm trying to make personally and with uh, 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 everyone else to address an old argument over and over and over again. Because what happens is that that becomes, you know, you become stagnant. All right. So, that's what I have, have done. But we have to go beyond that. We have to go uh, above and beyond that. We have to set up institutions in order to guide people through these steps. And, and so we keep a forward motion. And then people who are new, they start off at the beginning, but they're moving in a forward motion. You know, because any student that fails a grade in school, you got to go to summer school or you got to repeat the grade. And if anybody fails too much and they keep repeating the grades, I mean, the parents will be upset. You know, they'll be disappointed in their child, upset the whole nine. And so we need to look at this as a whole. Look, you know, look at look at look at what we're doing from a parent perspective. We're failing because we're repeating the same things over and over again. For example, the topic of evolution. And I'm just going to show I'm just going to give a couple of examples. The topic of evolution. Now, this is this is what happens. This is a, a big problem. People will hear the word evolution and may see a little bit of discussion about evolution, but then they'll come into the discussion and try to argue against evolution, against the theory of evolution, I should say. And yet they themselves have not taken any informal or formal study courses on evolution or have read uh, any any done any literature review about evolution, but yet they have a lot to say in arguing against evolution. So that's a problem because then it sparks the people who do know what they're talking about and do know. Then we have to correct, correct. We always have to correct people and point in this direction. And because it's not an, in an orderly, systematic, structure way of of educating people, then it becomes a problem, and that's what we see. So, for example, you ask somebody, what is a scientific theory? Or you, you'll hear people say that, um, you know, you'll say something and some people say, well, that's just a theory. It's not a fact. And then you educate them and say, well, a scientific theory is never a fact. A scientific theory is an explanation of facts. It's not a fact itself. It's an explanation of fact. That's what a theory is. A, the a theory is almost synonymous with the word explanation. So here it is. You have an event that occurs. A theory will explain the event that occurred. So there's a difference. So the fact is the event occurred. But a theory is is a substantiated uh, explanation for a set of substantiated facts. And so once you tell people this, then they're supposed to embrace it and move on and keep it moving. So no longer should they say out their mouth, oh, that's just a theory and not a fact. But yet, when we go through this with people, um, 
they act like that was never said and they start back over again. And we have to keep constantly repeating, repeating, repeating ourselves. So that you have people who are claiming that the um, Sesh Medunetra, which is the hieroglyphic writing system, has not been deciphered. That question has been settled over 150 years ago. It's only a small group of our people who are making that claim again today. And those people who make the claim, they themselves have never, ever taken a study course about the hieroglyphic writing system. Never. Or a basic course in linguistics, which, which will ground them in how languages work and how writing systems work in general. But specifically with the hieroglyphs, they've never taken a course informally or formally or have done a literature review about it. Same thing I said about evolution or, you know, the topics of what a theory is. But yet these people have so much to say about it. And so what happens in the social community is that these people will be liked, loved, be loved by a lot of people. And they have uh, char um, charisma, the charismatic, and the whole nine. They can hold your attention and they have and they can develop a lot a large following and they become influential and then they're influencing people to share in that ignorance so this is what we're seeing so the question is stands are we stuck and you know by just observation, we know we know that we're stuck. I mean, I'm I'm basically claiming that we are stuck. I would put in a question form, you know, to kind of open it up for discussion. But we are stuck. So the real question is, what do we do about it? So you all you all have already um, uh, made some comments about that, and and I'm throwing in there that we have to really tune in, tune down, or tighten up on uh, pedagogy, andragogy, developing methods of teaching. And then institutionalize it, create an institution similar to how our education system is in terms of its structure, where people walk in on one end and they walk out on another end. And these things take time. We can't people can't Google themselves to uh, to death about this. These a lot of these different topics, these things take time. And I know we're living in a microwave society where everything is fast paced everything is fast we got fast food drive through um restaurants we don't have to wait for the mail um to mail a letter off to somebody we can text message people uh, each other at an instant and see we basically have access to everybody in real time now and even information we got you know the internet with all of its uh encyclopedias see i remember growing up on my bookshelf when i was little my mother bought us, uh, me, my brother and my sister, uh, we had encyclopedias. There was a whole shelf, two shelves for me and two shelves because I, I'm the youngest. So I had I had the little children's encyclopedia. <laughs> and then my uh, my sister had the, uh, she made use of the other one, the, the adult. So it was like four shelves filled with encyclopedias and we had to look stuff up. Encyclopedias I had to go to the library, you know, take your little pencil, get a get a, a, a ca calling card, write down the uh, catalog number for a book, go down the bookshelf and pull it off the shelf, find it, pull it off the shelf and get it, check it out or read it there, put it back or whatever the case is. Nowadays, man, if you discuss that with a child, they will look at you like you're crazy. Like, what's that? Encyclopedia, what you had encyclopedias on as a book, what you know, where encyclopedias are online. So, anyway, so I'm saying we have we live in a very, very fast paced microwave um, society, but you cannot micro microwave genius, you can't microwave knowledge, you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, you can try, but you see the outcome is, is poison, all right? Just like you microwave your food, you know, you're gonna eat that food. Uh, you do it too many times, you know, people get complications from eating pure, purely microwave food. There's no love in that. You know, you just tear off the plastic and throw it in the microwave, punch some holes in it and microwave a, your whole meal. I mean, you know, that's that's totally impersonal. So anyway. Um, so, yeah, so that's 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 my um, take on what we have to do, you know. So 
And I'm, you know, I'm going to open the floor up, up again because I don't want to, you know, I, I, I tend to do that and hog the mic and everything. I'm, I'm trying to check out these uh, comments in the chat. But by all means, if anybody has anything to uh, add to what I was saying, uh, go for it. Um, yeah, I was just um, thinking about what you were saying and, and that's on point, you know, and um, actually, you know how they always say that, um, you know, uh, what I call cultural misappropriation, where, you know, white folks would like to be, uh, you know, black, but without all the extra baggage, um, we could call this like probably like a scholarship misappropriation, you know, because I think uh, we like the entertainment or people like the entertainment, um, but um, don't want to put in the work, you know, that um, scholarship entails. So. Um, you know, it's like we see a lot of entertainment, you know, but uh, obviously with this kind of um, things, like when you're talking about evolution, when you're talking about, um, you know, uh, Sash Medunetra and the decipherment and all of that, um, these are the kind of stuff that actually um, takes a long time to actually um, understand. And we see that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who don't want um, to take the time, but want to be part of the conversation or want to, you know, be scholars without actually, um, to, you know, putting in the work that, um, you know, real scholarship um requires so i would rather just call it like um scholarship misappropriation yeah and see and that's that's a good point uh to make is that we said we have to start calling things what they are you know i'm i'm big on misnomers you know misnomers actually uh lead you in the wrong uh direction in terms of your train of thought you know how people say train of thought well train tracks have have a trajectory and so if we get too comfortable with misnomers then we'll start believing what it is so for example a misnomer the most the popular misnomer the easiest one that i always uh use is the two words driveway and parkway um that we've we're very comfortable using those two words but they don't mean what they're applied to so a driveway is a place where you actually park your car and a parkway is a place where you actually drive your car so it's it's flipped it's in reverse why don't they call a a place where you park your car a parkway like right the the little strip of cement that you have in front of your garage why don't they call it a parkway it's where you park your car but we don't we call it a driveway and the highway, you know, the, the place where you go 60 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, we call it a parkway, but nobody's parking on that. People are driving 50, 50 miles an hour and above. So those are two famous, famously known misnomers. Those are, those are misnames, names that don't make any sense whatsoever, but we use it every day, all day, and we're comfortable doing it because we become numb to it. So we have to, we have to get in the business of accurately describing things. And, and, and being consistent with that. That way our thoughts will be on the right path. So that's one thing. So, I mean, I know you didn't um, say that directly, but that's a good point um, that you brought up. But another thing I wanna add into what I'm saying, what I've noticed. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm going through my Facebook um, timeline. And, and again, I, I signed up on Facebook in 2009. So I've been a Facebook user for eight years, all right? Um, and I go back as far as I can. I'm, I'm looking over this uh, for the past few days. I was looking over, um, you know, different conversations I've been in and stuff like that. And I, I suggest you all do the same thing. However long you've been on Facebook, do that. Go. You can go to your your um, personal page, click on activity log, and then you'll see um, the years on your right hand side. Just click on the through the years and scroll, scroll, scroll. Just just review some of the things that 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 you. Um, typed and on your timeline and so on and so forth or you can actually submit a uh a request for your for your facebook history so you can go to your go into your account and then submit for a download of your facebook history so i've done both and it's amazing what you see and so one of the things i noticed is that now mind you i've been on facebook for nine uh was it eight years okay now in 2010, I signed up 2009, 2010, I started seeing, now mind you, I'm, I'm skipping through my timeline, so I'm not reading everything. But so, you know, in 2010, I started seeing conversations that I was part of dealing with the topic of whether man comes from monkeys. 
you know, people made a claim that that um, evolution says that that human beings come from monkeys. This is back in 2010. OK, now and I see where myself and some other people were correcting that assumption. That's incorrect. The theory of evolution does not say that human beings come from monkeys. It just is nowhere in the science. But yet, the you know, in the conversation, the people were making that claim. So, you know, I'm, I'm saying no, evolution doesn't say that, you know, that it says that um, Homo sapiens sapiens and chimpanzees and so on and so forth have a common ancestor, but we don't come from them. We don't come from chimpanzees. We don't come from monkeys, but we all have a common ancestor. And, th and that person, you know, those people at that in 2010, they didn't grasp it or whatever the case is. And so these, these topics come up over and over and over again, even today, to this very day, uh, 2017, the same topic. Oh, you know, that's that monkey doctrine. You know, you all teach that, you know, man come from monkeys or whatever the case is. And we never say that. I've never said it. And I know people, um, my other colleagues on the on the Raw Squad, um, where 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 that's basically directed to, uh, don't say that either because the science doesn't say it. So now, but what I want to bring up is that that was eight. That's eight years. I've been on Facebook eight years. So 2010 to now, that's seven years. So that's seven years of that. Now, now listen, I'm gonna ask you all, how how long does it take to get a bachelor's degree in college? Anybody on the panel? Four years. Four years. Yeah, four years. Okay, now mind you, it's it's been seven years since I. Well, that's the that's the um, conversation that I saw back in two thousand and ten. Seven years have gone by. Okay, seven years is enough time to get a degree, a four year college degree in biology. Which, which is the, the subject matter that covers evolution, biological evolution, biology, all right? Um, and it's, that's four years. So you got seven years from now, 2010 till now, seven years. So you, that's enough time to get a master's to get postgraduate education in biology as well. Now, you would think that in seven years that people would catch on and take the time to just at least learn. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to go to college and get a degree in X, Y, and Z. I'm just, I'm bringing this up because I'm trying to put it in perspective in terms of the time frame that we're dealing with. Seven years have gone by and people are still arguing over the same wrong stuff when they themselves could have taken time to take an informal class or go to college but i'm saying enough time has gone by to where people could actually go to college and get a full get a degree bachelor a bs a bachelor of science in biology or whatever and then they would know what's what what is and what the, the theory of evolution says what it doesn't say they'll be able to actually um produce knowledge they would be able to actually advance the information you see so and I'm just using that as an example, but it goes for everything. Just watch. Just, 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 just think back in your head. You don't even have to go to Facebook now. Just think back in your head a year ago. Just a year ago to today. Just imagine the conversations you were in with other people. That's a whole year. 365 days have gone by. You, you know, you you can study and learn a lot within that time. But I don't think I don't see people taking advantage of the time that's elapsing and learning. So. People and we're repeating the same stuff over and over again. So at some point, man, it's like, what do we do? So all we could do is keep encouraging people to um, to learn. So I'm gonna give you another example. Um, how many of y'all remember the uh, Kemet on trial uh, so-called debate? How how long ago was that? It's about two years ago. About two years ago, right? I don't know why I want to say three, but let's just say two to be on the safe side. Two years ago, all right, Kemet on trial, the whole thing. Remember, remember one of the topics of Kemet on trial, whatever, was that ancient Egypt was homosexual and it was a focus on homosexuality in, in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and all of that stuff, right? Um, you got people arguing over that. You got people arguing over 
to different texts. Whether the laws of Ma'at are genuine or whether the Bible, the Ten Commandments copied from the laws of Ma'at and all of that, all of that stuff has um, transpired two years ago at the least. You know, I don't I, I, I want to say three, but I'm, I'm not sure. So I'll just stick with two because it's going to prove it's going to um, support what I'm saying. Um, now, in two years time, two years time, the people that have argued about anything dealing with Kemet in two years time, they could have taken the time to learn how to transliterate and translate ancient Egyptian texts in two years time. They could actually learn to read and write Sesh Nature, what we call Sesh Nature, what others call hieroglyphic uh, writing system. All right. They could have learned it. But the question is, did they? And the answer is no, not not from what you see. Now, I'm not saying this is I'm not making this statement as if it applies to every single person. But based on what we see, it has not been done. These people have not taken the time out to learn and sit up under the feet or up under the wings of somebody who who can teach them. It just hasn't been done. So I gave the example of evolution. The same people argue the same stuff over and over again. Or other or new people jump on the bandwagon and start discussing it. Same thing with uh, ancient Egypt. Instead of learning the language to be able to read the literature and learn directly from the primary sources, they're not doing it and they're arguing it. So we have to get into the habit of li listen. If 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 we're gonna jump into uh, a swimming pool of water, know how to swim. So if you're going to jump into the pool of a subject matter, know how to articulate that subject matter, know how to um, know the science, know, know the, the pros and cons, know the strengths and weaknesses of different claims within that subject matter. That's what I'm saying that has to be done, but it's not being done. So like, like let me ask you, Kim on trial was about two years ago. Now, everybody on the panel, when did you learn when did you when did you start to learn um when did you take your class for uh session metal nature was it after criminal trial or before after it was after so so you all you all are living proof that it could be done because everybody here on the panel who are members of the seshu maani metal nature has taken a 12 week course. All it takes is 12 weeks. If you, it, you know, th and that's, that's my course. Uh, I design a course that's 12 weeks long. Now I could teach it in a shorter period of time. If, if people, um, etched out more time of their day to do so, but comfortably it's 12 weeks. And really it's a total of 24 hours. 24 hours is the course, but it's broken up into two hours per session, which happens once a week. So two hours per session last 12 weeks, that, that's what you get with your 24 hours. So with so if you really think about it time wise, it's only a total of 24 hours. In 24 hours, you will learn how to transliterate and translate uh, basic ancient Egyptian inscriptions. But like I said, th that 24 hours is spread out over a 12 week period because no nobody's going to you know, study and learn for 12 hours straight nonstop. So realistically, it's broken up into 12 weeks. So in 12 weeks time, that's what? Three months. 12 weeks is three months. So in three months time, you can go from knowing nothing about the hieroglyphs except that they look nice and beautiful and pretty to actually reading it in three months. But here it is, two years, two years have gone by and these people have not have not taken that time out to do it. And I and you, oh, go ahead. Somebody's gonna say something. Well, I was gonna say you were just breaking down the timeline, and I was gonna say, uh, you know, some of these people are claiming to be autodidacts, and you know, I mean, they could really just, if they really wanted to, get your book. I mean, because your your course is like a, a go along with the book, so they could just get the book and study up on that, and really do it in a shorter amount of time than the three months, um, if they're serious about it. So I was just thinking about that. Right. So, yeah, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be mine because I don't want to make it seem like 
I'm the only one, you know, people come, come one, come all, come to me. I got the goods and I'm the only one that got the goods and learn from me and, and all that stuff. But because my point is that people need to slow down and take the time out to learn. We got to stop microwaving this stuff. And so now I know it can happen. The reason why I know it can happen is because I'm living proof of it. And you all on the panel, anybody who's been a part of as uh, a member of the Seshu Mani Meta Nature, living proof of it. So it's no longer uh, an idea that I could just talk about. No, I can show it and prove it, demonstrate it. All right. I can take someone who doesn't know anything. If they listen, if they if they take a course with me, because I can speak for myself. Now, there's other people that teach the uh, course and does do a very good job. Um, Dr. Riquetti Amin being one. Dr. Riquetti Amin is my uh, teacher as well from years ago. All right. And so um, her classes, you have um, Bonochi Montgomery. I believe he's in Detroit or Chicago, teaches a class as well and, and others. So it doesn't have to be me. So the point is that people need to take time out to learn. Whatever it is, and I'm just talking about the Egyptian language right now, but the same thing goes for evolution, genetics, whatever the subject is that people are going to try to sit up there and debate about, take a course before you start opening your mouth and debating about it. Because what happens is if you don't do that and you open your mouth up, my mouth up uh, when you talk to somebody who does know what they're talking about and have taken courses or whatever, they're trained in a specific issue, area of study or whatever, then it stops forward progress. If everybody just stayed in their lane, <laughs> traffic will be smooth. And so we have to understand that we have to be humble because in order, in order to do this kind of, kind of work, you have to be humble and you have to have tough skin because once you learn and you want to add or produce knowledge, your knowledge is, is, is up for, for being criticized, scrutinized, and uh, several attempts are going to be made to falsify your, your information. That's how science works. That's just the basics of science itself. And people have to understand that and not take things personal, not be afraid, you know, things like that. So I'm, I'm saying because we deal with, you know, as a Seshu Mahdi Meta Nature, we focus on the languages of ancient Kemet. And by default, by, or by extension, I should say, we focus on the culture. All right. Because language is the DNA of culture. So if you're going to focus on a language, then then there's an automatic uh, default um, setting where we're dealing with the culture. So in that aspect, I'm, I'm looking at people argue about things all the time about the language, but they themselves have not studied the language at all. They can't tell you one thing about the language. And, and, and then when they try to tell you something about the language, they're wrong. They'll tell you that the hieroglyphs can be read left, right, up, down, and in a circle. I've heard that claimed uh, before. People will ask the question, well, you know, how do you put a sound to a, a symbol? And, and, you know, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things claimed. People look at at different scenes, at different glyphs and assume that it's something that it's really not. Um, they'll look at a, a set of glyphs. It'll, it will look like flying crafts and they'll say that those are flying crafts. Those are UFOs. And the ancient Egyptian had access to advanced technology and and they had helicopters, Apache helicopters, hovercrafts and spaceships. And they'll look at they'll look at another scene and say, OK, the Egyptians had a command of electricity. They had light bulbs in the temple and things like that. And, then, you know, it's a whole bunch. Those are the, those are some of the popular um, claims. But I guarantee you. Those people who make those claims, you just ask them, ask them, have you ever taken a, a course in the language? Unanimously. Now, this is for me because I, I ask. I always ask. I always, that's like the first question I ask people. When they make those, these kinds of claims, I always ask them, have you taken an informal or formal course on the language or what literature have you read that will educate you about the language? And I'm going to tell you all. One hundred percent of the time that I've asked people that question, I have always got a negative answer. A per, a, the person has not taken a course formally or informally or have they read literature 
that will educate them, bring them up to speed about the language. Because like you said, um, you have people who, who are autodidact and, and may not sit under the foot of a, of a particular teacher personally, but they can read books and learn and comprehend and be good to go. But none of that has taken place in my experience of asking that question to anybody who makes those kinds of claims. None. So I don't know about you, about you all who are listening or in the panel. Maybe you all can tell me y'all have a different story to tell. But in my experience, no one who has ever made those claims um, that I, you know, the few that I just mentioned, and there's a whole bunch more. Um, can they ever say that they have uh, taken um, or learned the language? Not even general linguistics. Other than the language that they that they learn, that's just grammar. Like when you go to school and you learn English, you learn English grammar and literature. Grammar, you know, you learn verbs, you know, the parts of speech, verbs and prepositional phrases and things like that. But that's different than learning linguistics, like how languages work in general. You know, a lot of people don't don't bother to learn those kinds of things because, you know, we learn the language we speak and then that's good enough. So but we have to we have to stop and take time out to learn these kinds of things. So, um, you know, again, I don't want to keep on and on and on about the same about the same point that I'm that I'm going to be guilty of of uh, <laughs> being a broken record that I'm talking about. So, so you know, I just want to make my points and um, and you know, so I open the floor to anybody who has anything to add or whatever. Now, and I'm going to scroll up on on the uh, chat. To see if any anybody has a um, question, comments, or whatever, and I'll repeat them. So, anybody on email on the panel, you all can. The floor is open. Too, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, came in a little late. I'd like to say, Hotep Rebet, as many Jehudi Maat, and um, I just want to just add that um, I'm very fortunate. I feel uh, not lucky, but I feel fortunate to um, be surrounded by people or family that's smarter than me and I can learn from so I'm not so I won't get stuck. And it motivates me to study more. So it's, that's what it's about being around people that has like minds and um so you don't get stuck in the same place, having the same arguments. And I find that people that make those claims that Saber Wuja was just talking about are the same people that don't know. It comes from a place of ignorance. So that's why they ask those questions and they argue those points because they either have a um, doctrine they believe in that it goes against and they're trying to push it off on you or it's just the whole atmosphere of just the battle battle knowledge you know that was like people's it's this thing going on people want to be the smartest and sound soundless the smartest but at the same time sound ignorant and sound belligerent and it's just it's just an uptick it's a rise in the going on in the and the, the, the more people come behind us and we were shown this bad example, it's just going to get worse and worse. Right. I just wanted to add that to it. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, and I think you, you raised a very interesting point that, that, that I think is put out there on the margin as, as, instead of being one of the core issues that people really cultivate, which is humility and humbleness of your fellow brethren or sistren that may know something that you don't know. Like we have, we have this thing in the social community. There's more people statistically, there's more people that learn through conflict and battle. Like you, you said, instead of battle rap, you said battle. Um, I forgot what, what you, what you just said, but you have, you have people who, who, who are conditioned and wired their minds to learn through conflict rather than just learning from a place of humility and humbleness from just your fellow person who may know more than you. And so for some reason that, that may take a stab at the ego and I don't want to overanalyze it and try to sound like I'm everybody's therapist, but, but there, but there's more people who try to learn that way than there are people who learn through the way I just described, which is through humbleness and humility, where they can just sit at the foot and listen to someone who knows more than them. And then if that person who knows more than them knows how to teach properly, then 
it's not like I'm telling like I'm telling somebody what to think. I'm just teaching them methods on how they could think for themselves. And that is the best way to be a teacher, you know, because the word teacher, you know, there's a difference between the word teacher and the word educator. You know, a teacher simply points out things. And I don't want to make it, I don't want to over, oversimplify the job of a teacher, but I'm saying the word itself, if you look at the etymology of the word and how it how it developed its meaning over time, it was it has to do with pointing out something. And an educator is a is a word that indicated something being drawn out from someone. So at the very core, a teacher points out things and brings things to the attention of someone. And an educator helps the person draw from within them what's already in them and bring it out to the forefront. So with that understanding, a real teacher or real educator knows that it's not about them. It's about the person that they're that they're dealing with. So that crushes the ego right there because you're not trying to impress them, oppress the next man on you. You're trying to get them to be impressed on themselves, to get them to draw things from within them outward or to point out things that will help them do that. That's a teacher and an educator. So teachers and educators need to be. Uh, people need to hold wear the same uh, both of those hats at the same time be a teacher be an educator and do that and so but we have to be humble enough to be able to learn from people who who can do that and i and i don't see that i don't see enough of that people learn through conflict they got to debate you they got to argue with you just to learn and you got to beat them down beat them over the head with information um just so they can learn and they don't learn right there on the spot because i can have a debate with somebody now, you know, I went to school for debating, like I was on a, a debating team. And there's a lot of things that they teach you in a debating, in a debate on the a debating team that will seem like it has nothing to do with debating, but it has a lot to do with debating, you know, but I, that's a whole nother uh, topic. But um, I could say and debate with someone. One of the things that they, that they tell you is that you never have the you never go into it with the expectations to convert the person you're debating what you're really doing is you're convincing the audience i or the judges if there's judges involved like even in court and in a trial in a in the average court trial the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney they're not trying to convince each other the prosecution not trying to convince the the, the defense attorney the defense attorney is not trying to convince the prosecutor the prosecutor they're trying both to convince the jury that's what they're doing so so the same thing so you walk in there you don't try to convince somebody but what happens is if you if you show enough evidence the person that you're debating you could be all right and have the evidence eventually it's going to sink in and and they'll have to embrace what you what you presented but because of the ego and everything like that, they're not going to do that right there on the spot. So that's a that's a basic understanding that we have to have. But the focus is on the audience, is on the onlookers, is on the listeners. And in the court situation, it would be on the jury, not the people sitting in the gallery because they have no no judgment power. They're not the ones that have to convict or acquit someone. So you're not even trying to appeal to the audience in the in there. You, you're just appealing to the jury. So so whatever your target audience is, that's who you deal with. And a good teacher, a good educator are, are those people who can teach proper methodologies on how people or how other people should um, think, not what to think, but how to think. And that's what that's what we need more of. And that's where I, I mentioned the word pedagogy. You know, we need more of that andragogy for adults. All right. So we have to really um, uh, get more of that. But I want to I wanted to read one of the questions I, I scrolled up on the chat and um, Adrian um, Padilla or Padilla. I may be pronouncing your name wrong and I, I apologize for that. Um, but he. Uh, and I don't even want to say I, I look at the icon, but I, I know some sisters who name Adrian and brothers who name Adrian. So <laughs> forgive me on that, too. But I'll just read the question. Um, when you study the language, can you uncover the way they describe numbers or if they assign them the same way we do today via numerology? Um, the short and skinny answer to that 
is that when you do study a language, you definitely can tell how numbers were, were, were used. All right, you can definitely tell that. But now we have to be careful because there's a difference between mathematics and numerology, what we're calling numerology today. And so you have to be very specific about what it is that you're calling numerology. Because I've seen, the reason I say that is because I've seen people refer to math as numerology, but they're really talking about math. But then I've also seen people that use numerology in, in you know, the kind of general sense that we think about numerology, where you're uh, applying numbers to, like, for example, um, if, I, if I look up at my clock right now and it's 11, right now it's 1106, but if I look it up and it says 1111, then people will use that time, those two numbers, those, those two, uh, 11 and 11, and try to apply something dealing with some kind of phenomena and things going around. And that is one of the things that they put up under the umbrella of numerology, you know, like what's your birth date, what time is it now, and, and things like that. So in that sense, um, you, once, you under, once you study the language, you can see if the Egyptians did, it, did anything like that. So to answer your question, the answer is yes. If you study the language, you'll, you'll know how they dealt with numbers. Now, if, now, your second part of the question, if they actually did with their numbers what we do today in terms of numerology, you, you can make that determination yourself once you study the language. But as far as um, my studies and what I see, what I can clearly see, and I can say no, they, don't, they didn't use the numbers in that fashion. Let me just, um, can I add in something just in case he isn't familiar with the Seshmedu Nature? The first nine numbers, um, one through nine, are just strokes. So if you wanted to say the number three, you would just, it, you would be three strokes. And the thing with the, the numbers, they are read the same way that the glyphs are. So you want to, um, if you're reading, if the glyphs are all facing to the left, you're reading left to right. The numbers will be in in the order um, in the, in the direction that you're reading them. So yeah, the first nine numbers are just strokes. I don't know if that helps them out, but um, yeah, and to add that in. that's good. And also to to add to what you just said, that the way that they write a number, like today, we'll we'll write. Let's just say um, three hundred sixty-five. Okay, notice how I said that three hundred sixty-five, and so. Um, and when we write that, we put a three, a six, and a five. And everybody understands that to be 365. Now, in Seshmedu Netcher, they wouldn't write it out that way. You would actually see three hundreds. You would see a glyph that represents a hundred written three times. And then you'll see a glyph that represents 10 six times, giving you 60. And then you'll see a glyph that represents one. Or a single stroke that June just mentioned, uh, written five times, and and all together that would give you your three hundred sixty-five. All right, so that so the the way that they even conceptualize the numbers in a visual format would tell you that they operated, they they couldn't have operated by way of numerology the same way we do today. Just, just that fact alone will tell you that it had to have been different. Now, now, um, now I'm saying I'm being specific about numerology now because there are things that the ancient Egyptians did with um, figurative language, and that's something that's something that we really have to uh, look look at. We really, really, really have to look at. Um, it's something that we don't study today. It's not. It's not a systematic study today. Like you don't you don't take a course. There's no uh, a bachelor's degree in figurative language, per se. But we really have to look at that because uh, Africans, in general, all across the continent, in all the mul multiple communities and ethnicities that are on the continent of Africa, and it's very diverse, by the way. But most of the African communities on the on the continent were experts at figurative expression. And 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 uh, what I want you, what what you all should do is look up figurative expressions or figurative language, and under that umbrella of figurative um, 
expressions, you'll find words like metaphors, allegory, symbolisms, hyperboles, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a whole bunch that fall up under the umbrella of figurative expression. And see, this is what we call it today. Like we, we named it figurative language or figurative expressions today. But back there in ancient times and even in recent historical times, I mean, even today, they still do it today. So I'm not trying to make it sound like it's a, it's a past, a has been type of thing. But back when it was, it was really, really prevalent in the forefront of everybody's mind is that was the mode or, or way that language had to be uh, done. And the reason why is real simple. It's, for, it's just some common sense stuff. Think about it. Today, we like right now, uh, most of us speak English. OK, and we communicate in English and English is, is pretty much the most wide use uh, language across the globe. All right. And uh, the whole planet. And so. We have advantage today of dictionaries. Now, I don't, I'm not sure how many words in the English dictionary. Does anybody know off top of your, off top of your head? Roughly. I'm looking it up real quick. Let's let's look it up. Let's look it up. Roughly, how much? How many words are in the lexicon of the English language? All right, let's see. I just want to get a rough number. Um, it says the second edition of the twenty-volume Oxford English Dictionary contains full entries for one hundred and seventy-one thousand four hundred and seventy-six words in current use, and forty-seven thousand one hundred fifty-six words that are obsolete okay so so let's just add those two together and just say roughly what uh 210 let's just round it to 200,000 words 200,000 words that uh now let's just use the one that's current use 171 let's just let's just stick with that 171,000 171,000 words in the english language all right now we can do that today because we have writing. We we use writing. We we all grew up in in a, in a society of very literate literal. I mean, literate society. We we write literature, and dictionaries are contained in the uh yeah uh, dua for that Shazmu yeah Shazmu put up exactly what I read. So, um, we have dictionaries that we can consult. Now, mind you, out of that 171 words in in the English dictionary. I don't care. You could, you could, most of us were born speaking English, spoke English all of our lives, and we will still never know, or right now, we don't know all 171,000 words in the English language. But we can go to a dictionary and look up words that we don't know and everything. So, uh, my point though is that in ancient times they didn't have the luxury of a dictionary they didn't have a luxury of a very quick synchronized communication over long distance uh geographical distances and things like that so so there in 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 the in historical and ancient times they had to have word economy they had to have a very small vocabulary and so what what was done they they uh what today will be called homonyms um you know, homonyms you got homonyms uh what else you got um homophones homonyms and things like that today and we have what's called um uh antonyms synonyms well i should say synonyms not antonyms but synonyms and things uh words that you know mean very similar things but they're different words but they mean similar things and stuff like that so imagine back in the past when we didn't have dictionaries and whatnot, they had to have a very, very, very limited, small, manageable amount of words. So they had to develop ways to convey several things, sharing words. And so there's a there's a phenomenon that that um, Egyptologists or even linguists will call punning, and also another a phenomenon called paronymy, where concepts were merged up up on one word based on the similarities of what their meanings are and sounds how words sound when it when they're pronounced if if a word is pronounced this way and a concept is attached to it but yet a totally separate concept is attached to a, a um, to something and it sounds similar they will connect those two through a process called paronymy and I'm just giving you a very paraphrased um, 
definition of what paranomy is and you have punning so likewise when when you record data you had to record it in a very efficient and economic way so that people can learn from you from it number one and two keep it in the memory of the people from generation to generation and therefore what we call myth today was a, was an actual method of recording information and a myth is a myth so let's just say um, like for example people try to compare science with myth and and we got to be careful doing that we, we shouldn't do that science is science and myth is myth but and you can't really compare the two because they're just two different things so much so that you can take a scientific observation that has been observed hypothesized about tested and then have an explanation of what you observed in the whole nine so to, so to become a theory but then when you record your theory you can record it in the form of a narrative that today we call a myth i hope you all get that so i can perform straight up science that follows the scientific method to the t and develop a theory because that's the goal of a scientific method in general and develop a theory about the whole process and what i've i've observed but when it comes time for me to pass it on to the next man or the next generation i can organize my theory into a narrative that today we call a myth and and the only way that you have to, that you'll be able to understand it is if you knew how to decode the myth so there are myths that are encoded and and it's the culture that provide the keys to this decoding process and today we would have to actually search that out and 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 look for it but if you are part and parcel of the culture it will come natural like for example um in a normal conversation i use this example all the time if i say to someone um that um I'm 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 called I'm called to give a speech before a uh, large body of people, right? And I tell the person that say, hey, you know, you got somebody tell me, uh, that, hey, you got five minutes, and then you 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 uh, got to go up to the podium and give your speech. And I tell that person, well, well, hold up, I need a little bit more time. I got butterflies in my stomach. You know, that's what I say. I say I have I have butterflies in my stomach. Now, because we're part and parcel of this culture they will know what i mean by that i have butterflies in my stomach it doesn't mean that i literally have the insect uh that was once a caterpillar and, and turned into a butterfly li actually living and flying around in my stomach they understand that the word butterfly in this sense is a metaphor for nervousness so what i'm really saying is that i'm nervous but i don't say i'm nervous i say i got butterflies in my stomach all right so and people understand that i got butterflies in my stomach so you don't need a special decoder encoder and whatnot because you're both part and parcel of of the uh culture now so in in african communities this was understood people had an understanding and 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 people were actually trained and walked through this understanding you know so these are the kind of things that we have to um keep in mind when we're doing this kind of study and this takes time because we're so far removed from from ancient anything the moment you put the word ancient on something that means we're we're, we're removed from it you got prehistory which is history in this case is uh literate literacy writing so pre-writing is really saying like saying prehistory and then you got ancient you got prehistory and then ancient and so we're so far removed so we, all this stuff takes time we can't we can't microwave this so you know like i said i'm, I'm hogging the mic i don't want to um keep it up because i'm i'm start repeating myself but we really 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 have to move forward slow we got to become the turtle and not the rabbit become the turtle and not the rabbit we got to take this thing slow because you can go slow and long or fast and wrong you know i don't know if i just made that up but however that saying goes <laughs> hey, you know i'm, I'm known, known for, Star Friday. 
<laughs> right, right, right. Say, but you remember before that uh, when we were working on um, the book and we were having discussions behind the scene, um, you kept saying, you know, we were trying to put people that are garnering all this attention with all of these claims that they were throwing out that <clears throat> if you know these people are if we use these people correctly that we could move our people into a, a different perspective if these rah-rah people were used directly to rah-rah gain the attention get people in the building and then let the teachers teach that we actually can progress these people. Like, I think that that's like the biggest solution for us because, you know, you still have these people following craziness. But if these people that are following the craziness actually were in a, in a place where they can learn, then we wouldn't have some of these conversations that we have. Right. And that's a good point too, and that that kind of ties into what I said earlier. Is that look at the cool, look at the school system? Um, you start you start a child off in kindergarten, um, and then you walk them. They they pass. They get proficient at whatever is taught there. Then they go to the first grade, second grade, so on and so on, all the way to the twelfth grade. They graduated high school, and now they can make um, a decision to go on to college or not. So. When when a let's say you have a hundred students in kindergarten, then they all go to first grade and so on and so forth. The school doesn't close once those little kids at at um, kindergarten grow, get older, and graduate the twelfth grade. The school doesn't close down. They're always accepting the the newer children at at the kindergarten level again. So we always have to have kindergarten teachers. We always have to have first grade teachers. We always have to have second grade and so on and so forth. So if everybody understood their strengths and weaknesses, and this is another thing, in, in this social community, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to know what we're strong in and what we're weak in. And, and we have to lean on each other when it comes time to our weaknesses. So if I'm strong in one area, but weak in another, if if it calls if something calls for me to to perform something that I'm weak in, then I should I should have enough in intellect to lean on another person who's strong in that area. And see, this is what we don't do, because I think in the social community, a lot of things is ego driven, and there's a lack of humility and a lack of humbleness in the social community. So we have to bring these things to the forefront and cultivate that. And it and this may be boring. Or whatever the case is, but it's a sacrifice that we're gonna have to make as a people, and and we we just gonna have to do it because we're attracted to fastness, we're attracted to drama, we're attracted to who's arguing, who's who's intellectually masturbating on each other, who's debating. When is the next debate coming up? Now, uh, debating is good. So when I say that, you know, some people think I'm I'm trying to um, say debating is negative. Uh, debating in and of itself is a very good thing because that's actually how if, uh, knowledge is advanced by by questioning and trying to falsify things and two opposing um, two opposing arguments based on evidence that both both sides can bring to the table is a very healthy good thing because you know a lot of good things can come out of that exchange, but. The debating that we're, we've become used to seeing is not real debating uh, 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 most of the time. Sometimes it may, may be, but um, people have to really switch up, be humble, um, be honest with themselves, know what they're strong in, know what they're weak in, and be quiet on what they're weak in, speak up on what you're strong in, and then it'll be all good. Like Jehudi Mott said. If everybody stayed in their lane, traffic will run smoothly. You know, period. I mean, I mean, all, all, of, all of us, all of us, been on the highway where where um, the traffic will bottleneck for no reason, no accidents, no nothing, and then all of a sudden the, the traffic just goes slow, and you wondering, you wondering why, 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 and you late for work or late for whatever the case is, and in your mind you're saying the same thing, but like, dang, on, won't you just keep your eyes forward 
and stay the speed limit, then everything will be all right. So same thing here. If people stayed in their lane, everything will be all right. Learn from each other. We could. It's okay to challenge each other, but I mean, you know, the way people go go around, man. You you would swear. I swear you would swear that people took uh, a four year degree in college, a master's course, and got a PhD in something. The way they argue, and they haven't done none of the above. Yeah. Um. See, that's a good point because um, and especially um, if you're looking at African systems and initiatory systems and all that, and even just um, as you've always um stated, um, even just regular um um you know institutes learning institutions like school, you know um you know when you there's a time to be a student and there's a time to be a teacher, and all teachers have been students at one point, but what we're seeing in the social community, like um like you know you always say is that um, we have people just, uh, you know, just walk off the gate and they're teachers. They have never been students, you know, and all of that. And then you have some people who are in the process of learning something, probably in the right place, some in the wrong place, but then the process of learning and teaching at the same time. And this is where most, you know, where people go wrong because, um, you know, you can be eating and talking at the same time. So there's, when you're trying to soak in information, you can be, um, you know, uh, releasing the information that you're learning because in the pro- when you're in the process of learning, you're actually, um, you know, you will be making errors and all of that stuff. So, um, you know, like like we do at the Seshu, I mean, we're learning and what we have, uh, what we have learned is what we share, but well, in the process of learning, we cannot be, um, you know, we, we don't talk about stuff that we don't know. You know, we have to go through the research process like everybody else, you know, find out, um, you know, what is factual, what is not factual. And that's what we share. But most people just, um, you know, um, come across something and then, you know, just want to share it and want to share it as something that they are, you know, uh, professionals in or, you know, that they are proficient in which they are not. So this is um, this is the other thing that we see. There's a time to learn. And when you're learning, you just need to be quiet. So a lot of people just need to be quiet. Exactly. Yeah. Let me bring it back to the language, because uh, when you look at the Seshmedu Nature, uh, the determinative, or uh, also called the classifier for the word Seba, is the the man holding the, the stick. Um, yeah, holding the stick. And I think a lot of this, or some of it, has to do with uh, people lacking good character. Um, in language, character is Ked, which also can mean to build. You know, and that's fascinating to me, where you all often hear the phrase uh, build, you know, build character or build good character. And in the Seshmedu Ses- Nature, we have um, both those words transliter- transliterated uh, exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And if you notice what we started on, not started on, but what we focused on a long time ago, over a year ago, is that we had a series of hangouts dealing with good character. And we went through a whole, probably a whole month where we focused on good character uh, on Facebook. We had Facebook posts about good character. We talked about the maxims of Patahotep, um, Kagimni, um, and the others that are in the uh, genre of literature called the Sabait or the instructions. And so we went through that and we talked about good character. You have to have good character because really at the, at the core of a lot of initiation systems of indigenous people all around the world is the cultivation of character. Because if you think about it, what is the word culture? Culture, like when you think of culture, without even looking it up, if you, if you, um, I mean, looking up a, a technical d- um, definition, depending on what uh, area or what discipline you're dealing with, but in general, uh, for something to be cultured, like if you say that is cultured, you're you're using it in a sense that it is the opposite of being wild, because you have something that is wild versus something that is cultured, and we use it in a in a synonymous way of domesticated. So we say something is wild or something is domesticated. So so we use the word culture a lot to synonymously mean domesticated, something that was that was um, molded and shaped to be what it is that that's what it means to have culture you know in a lot of people's minds and in, in the way that it's used a lot and we can you know we can get technical into the into the meaning of the word and stuff like that but that's the general and so and so what happens is people some people 
never ever cultivate good character and so at the heart of a lot of these initiation systems all across indigenous um, um, societies is the cultivation of that good character because everybody is born a wild animal now that may sound funny for me to say it and for you to hear it but but everybody is born wild that's why you go through a domestication process but we call it upbringing we you know we we use different words for it because we're humans but i guarantee you if we were to have this conversation about animals those are the words we would choose now us humans being humanocentric <laughs> or you know uh human humanistic egotistic or whatever you call it uh we don't like to use the words that we would use for animals for us like a lot of a lot of people don't even see themselves as animals but we are of the animal kingdom we are of the taxonomic label called animalia which which means that we are animals we're just a mammal class of animals and then of the mammals we are primate you know so on and so forth that's a whole nother whole nother show but the point is is that everyone is born what we're calling a baby see if i say baby the first thing you think of in your mind you think of this cute little this cute little creature you know it has no teeth it's crying it's whining or it's got big eyes and and you know you just melt when you see little babies and stuff like that but when babies are born they are wild animals and so you raise your child we that's how we work we word it we raise them but what we're doing is we're domesticating it that's what we're doing and i know I, trust me i know this sounds funny but that's what we're doing we're domesticating the person the the child and we're we're molding it we're conditioning it we're cultivating it we're giving it culture so one of the at the heart of these initiation systems is to cultivate this uh character to build good character because you go from a wild animal as a um as a infant into being a domesticated animal called a human and then you become later on if you are um uh luckily enough you will grow into divinity so you go from an animal to a human to being divine and that's the three major stages of human lifespan you start off as an animal you get domesticated and you and you you embrace your humanness and then you go on further and and get postgraduate lessons so to speak quote unquote uh and you become divine so the goal is to become divine a divine being or a divine person you know that's where it is so so that's very important that's something that we discussed before about building good character and so as as a as a as a group of people you know how mature are we on 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 that path you know we could talk about personally like everybody can speak personal individually like hey you know i'm um this is where i am but i'm talking about us collectively as a people we're 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 still immature we're very immature and, th and this this is part of the topic tonight are we stuck are we immature now we're going to stay this way and i saw someone um type in the chat so so what are we going to do to get unstuck and like i said so what what can we do to get unstuck we can we can uh, build institutions and these institutions have to be designed to be very systematic and procedural they have to be structured in a way to where people walk through these graduated uh lessons where you go from one study to the next to the next to the next and build and build and build upon each other and it has to be a a way to be able to judge the progress first you have to have a goal then you have to have steps uh manageable steps because we can't we got to be realistic we can't just have a goal and then try to swallow the whole plate of food so we have to have manageable bite-sized steps that leads us to that goal and we have to w have a w an objective way to judge our progress as we travel that journey that's what the institution needs to be set on so it has to be some kind of institution system put in place that's why i mentioned the word pedagogy and andragogy you got adult and childhood teaching methods that have to be at play 
So that's what we have to do. And that's part of the discussion that we need to have. Everybody wants to pull the cart before the horse. We, people want to talk about nation building and uniting and doing this and that. But yet we can't even get the fundamentals down uh, pat first. You, you can never build a nation if you have not es established relationships with people first and cultivate, it, cultivate that. You're just not going to do it. That's why we fail. We fail. Out of all the nation building ideas that people wrote about, did about, boots on the ground about, and everything like that, look at where we are. So we don't need a, a uh, per se now, we don't need a civil rights movement or uh, whatever movement and stuff like that. We need a, a um, spiritual cultivation movement. We have to do that. We have to do that. The yeah, first institution. Okay, oh, right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just go ahead. I want to add on to your point about um, building relationships. That's very important. A very important step. And um, the problem is that social media is a breeding ground for for bad character and not and not establishing good relationships. Yes, you know? because it goes unchecked. See, social media takes the social media takes the uh like uh, uh I don't know if you said it or or June said it that the word Siba, the word Siba or Seba. In Rani Kemet, which is the language of ancient Egypt, um, in the writing, in the glyphs, you see as a determinative, you see a man holding a stick. Or in some cases, you'll just see the arm holding the stick, which means that there's force involved. There's some kind of discipline and force involved with the aspect of teaching, aspect of instructing someone. And it means that something has to be beat into, into shape. So your mind has to be beat into shape or you have to be beat into shape. So your mind has to be disciplined or you yourself has to have to be disciplined. So what social media does, it takes the stick out of the hand of the instructions. And so people can just run wild with what they do. So there's no discipline. There's no discipline there because social media is so impersonal. You know, uh, anybody, anybody can... Um, can start a YouTube channel or you do a sign up with Google Gmail. I mean, they got me, you know, get a Gmail account and you off and running. That's it. And, and, and not only that, people got multiple Gmail accounts, multiple YouTube channels, you know, that they do things out of or whatever. So it, there, there's no regulatory system in place. And even the word regular, the word correct, the word regular regulate and all that stuff, believe it or not, um, those words, and concepts that are attached to them tie into the word ma'at. And and for anybody who wants more information about that, uh, consult with the brother Asar Imhotep because he did some work on that word, linguistic work on that word. So um, go seek uh, his work out on that. But if you really think about it, the word for law, the word for truth, the word for regulate, the word for guide, to guide something for something to be the rule and guide, like we say rule and guide, you know, a straight line. Like when you, when you want to draw a line on a piece of paper, um, which would you do? Which would you prefer? Would you draw it freehand or would you use a straight edge to, to do it against? And most likely somebody would choose a straight edge of something, whether it's a ruler. And it's funny how we call it a ruler, but we use a ruler and we'll draw a straight line. And that straight line becomes the, the uh line of judgment that's what we make our judgments on even when you learn as an artist when you learn to draw faces you got to draw the uh the crosshairs and that's that, that's basically your 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 line uh your rule your guide and if you're doing um angle drawing or whatnot you have to move those crosshairs a little bit so what my point is that we use certain things as guides and rules and all these things um are eliminated when it comes to social media they're, they're they disappear so anybody could do anything and and there's no measuring rod so i mean you know we watching these shows on youtube we don't know if these people are telling the truth we don't know if they're right or wrong or whatever we don't know what their background is we don't know what kind of stuff they study to bring them to their conclusions and whatnot and then when you ask them some people get offended because they get insecure and sensitive we have a, we have a lot of insecure sensitive people on social media because they're not built to do scholarship. Scholar, scholars, look, any real scholar knows that once they make a public claim, 
whether it's in a book form, pamphlet form, article form, journal form, a PDF on academia.edu, whatever the case is, a real scholar knows that once they put that out there in the public, here comes the criticism. So real scholars don't get uptight, don't get sensitive, and don't get insecure and got to fuss and fight and, and or whatever when when their work is actually examined and analyzed but we have a lot of people who don't do that they get they go the other way with it you know but i wanted to read something that uh but the brother bud john said he said first the first institution has to be re has to be re rebuilt called the nuclear family and he is so right about that he is, he is so right about that 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 you know we have to build it like a body you know the the family forms the cell of the organ or uh you know you have to build from there and so we have to get family the institution of family back in order you know we have to understand the relationships within a household like we don't even understand that let alone how we go and relate <laughs> relate to a totally a total stranger you know or whatever the case is you know, so we, we have a lot of work to do. And, and and again, this brings us back to the to the topic of this hangout. Are we stuck? Look, with all this work we have to do, we have no business being stuck. Like I should not see anybody arguing about whether Kemet is homosexual or not. I should not see people arguing or whether human beings come from monkeys uh, or not anymore. I shouldn't see arguments of whether the meta has been deciphered. Um, and all these things that we see, I mean, I mean, you know, it's crazy. Think Those three that you name, it's like we we put out the book. Um, I hope people can see see it on the screen. But we put out the the book has a uh, ancient Egyptian writing uh, been deciphered, and the other two also have publications from uh, the squad members. Uh, Jonathan Owens, he he dealt with the homosexuality in Kemet um, in his book. That was written a few years ago. Yeah, the um, handbook to the conscious community. Right, and then the other way. I mean, it's like we have publications on all those. Um, uh, Ankh has his um, his little uh, booklet out. So I mean, we we there's information that you know even before us that has dealt with these claims. We've dealt with these claims, and you're right. We should not, you know, be in, even entertaining uh, some of these arguments. You know, some of these claims and arguments from people who are clearly understudied. And so, so that brings that brings up a, the point we made earlier, is that what can we do? So I said personally, when I go back through my Facebook timeline, I started to write articles because I saw I found myself repeating myself. Like like one of the biggest things that I um, that I came in contact with when I first got on Facebook was this alien. It was it was three things that was that was that was like at the forefront when I first started on Facebook was aliens in ancient egypt um dinosaurs in ancient egypt four things aliens in ancient egypt dinosaurs in ancient egypt the uh flying spacecrafts in ancient egypt and the light bulbs those are the four things that i kept kept explaining myself too many times so i said look let me write an article about these things and that's what i did and i posted it on the website so from that point forward all i do is Give people the link. Whenever I see people arguing, I just give people the link. I don't have to argue it anymore. I don't have to spend time out to argue it. I give people the link. After they read it, then they could come to me and say, well, listen, brother, I read what you said, and I disagree with this, or I disagree with that. Then I will entertain it. And likewise, like you said, June, we wrote a book called Has the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Writing System Been Deciphered? A Rebuttal to Walter Williams. So listen. No, no longer do we, as the Seshumati Metanetra, we don't have to argue with people about whether it's been deciphered or not. Get the book, read it, and if you disagree with anything we say, then bring it up. Then we can have a conversation about it. But don't try to argue with me before you even read the book or any book uh, for that matter. And see, that's how we have to. So that's the answer to Sister's question. Um, and I, I hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, Dialer. Dialier, <laughs> I'm probably butchering that name. Just say D. Just say D. <laughs> oh, oh, I was just say D for short, and I, I apologize for that. But uh, she asked the question of, okay, so how do we get unstuck? So, so see, we we're putting it to practice. We are putting out, um, where we're doing our best to put out either articles 
or publications and we got some we got some lined up like like right now it's july uh before the year's out we're gonna have some more publications out there so y'all be on the lookout for that but we're putting out publications because we're trying to move forward we're trying to address some things in a mature professional manner like we did with this rebuttal to uh professor walter williams about the decipherment claim we did in a professional mature manner in written format um that will teach people edify people all people have to do is get the book and then after reading the book you want to come to us and and offer some op you know opposing evidence or whatever the case is hey we'll be more than happy to um to you know have that conversation but if you're gonna sit there and just argue ad infinitum and not even read anything then no later for that you know let's keep it moving so that's that's what we have to do we have to keep things moving keep things moving and then you got you know um some of the old arguments uh whether whether or not the egyptians were black is 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 you know popping up every now and then you know check out the job and theophile benga handled that in 1974 you know and and yeah. thoroughly thoroughly handled that you know and you know and and their work has been advanced since then since 1974 you know that's over 30 what 40 years ago so we got to keep it moving keep it moving science science is always moving forward that's one thing that's a beautiful thing about science people people don't like the fact like this is what people have a misconception about science they'll say that okay science says this at one time and then it switches up another time and and anybody that says that they they don't understand what science is science is two things science is the methods and tools used to know when something is known and then the second thing that science is it's the body of knowledge that is produced by the first uh sense i just gave so you got you got the methods and tools that allows you to know when something's known and then you have the body of knowledge that's a result of that and so science is always self-correcting and expanding why because it takes what is known and it puts it to the test so it's like it's like a forever growing picture and if you if you have a a small piece of a like let's say if anybody have done jigsaw puzzles those real those real big ones if 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 i was to um buy a big jigsaw puzzle let's just say it's a 2000 piece jig jigsaw puzzle and if i just dumped all the pieces on the floor and never showed you the picture of what it's supposed to look like from the from the cover of the box and i just dumped the pieces on there it would take you a lot longer to to put it together than if you had something to judge it by if you had the picture to look at and you know you'll you'll be able to to judge what, what pieces go where and obviously you'll start with the corners and you'll start with the straight edges um and get the you know get the get the um the borders set first and then you start to plug in the pieces well science if you only have a certain piece you don't have the bigger picture yet so you develop explanations based on what you have and what you know and then as new data comes in you may have to make adjustments to what you said previously that's all so science itself is self-correcting and that's the beauty of science but now the difference between belief systems is that belief systems are st static science is dynamic belief systems are static once you adhere to a belief system it can't change the bible can't change the quran can't change the torah if if that's all people deal with it's not changing that's it science itself is is a dynamic uh thing and belief systems are um static it's stuck and so are we stuck so we're treating this like a belief system and we can't do that so anyway you know i don't want to keep we, we've been on for two hours <laughs> so i'm trying to see if anybody in the chat uh has some more comments or questions so if yeah if y'all have any questions about anything that we've covered on previous videos or anything that we talked about tonight feel free to at, uh, ask type it in and we'll address a couple of them before we um before we close up but like i said i just want to have a, a kind of um open-ended uh discussion about this question are we stuck and now you all know what i meant by uh the question but uh yeah anyway the floor is open if anybody wa uh, wants to chime in and add to to what i was saying 
I think June, you wanted to say something. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this too. <laughs> okay, uh, a couple, a couple of these claims. Um, that what are some of the claims? Um, has the hieroglyph writing system been deciphered? Absolutely, yes. Not only has it been deciphered, but um, the Europeans have come together and actually edged out a scientific discipline to study all things Egypt, called Egyptology. They're utilizing this scientific discipline to extract resources, intellectual resources, from the ancient Africans of the Nile Valley. But here we are, us, descendants of Africans from all over various places on the continent, because that's another thing that people uh, believe that those who study Egypt, that we say that we all from Egypt, <laughs> which is crazy. But um, those of us who are African descent, we're saying the opposite. We're not utilizing the intellectual resources of the ancestors that are in these various places in Africa. Not only are we not using it, but we say we go further and say that we can't use it because we say that their language has been has not been deciphered and never will be. And we addressed that in the previous video when we addressed uh, Professor Walter Williams' recent interview. So I'm not going to go back into that. That's so. That's a claim that needs to be out the way because we understand the grammar and everything about uh, the language. Not everything. I don't say 100%. Um, about the language. There's, there's room to still learn, but we are so far beyond the question of whether it's been deciphered or not. All right. Um, and this winter time, this winter, um, be on the lookout for a new grammar textbook and new grammar courses that are going to be um, available that I'm going to be um, designing and structuring. And I'll be teaching that in the winter time. So this winter time, um, look out for that. Um, what else? Oh, the various different Neturu, there are people, uh, I saw this today, that people are saying that, or people believing that the Neturu are actually uh, flesh and blood sentient human beings that once walked the earth, uh, you know, talked and, and ate and did this and that. And that's a problem. That's not true. And that's a problem. And what people are doing when they say that, they are projecting their belief system and their own ideologies on that of ancient Kemet. So don't do that. Um, what's another recent claim that's made? Real recent. Anything? I mean, it'd be so many during the, during the week. I'll, I'll see it. But, um, but I, you know, I can't think of anything right now off the top of my head. Theosophical teachings, like Africa's the origin of all spiritual systems. They make that claim. They bring in um, a multitude of things with that argument. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you said that because that, that reminds me about this um, quote-unquote white man's thing. You know, a lot of people want, want to pull the uh, Crayola crayon card and say that's the white man's science, or that's what the white man says, or that's the white, 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 whatever, white, white, white say. And really, that's that's a um, that's a skate, that's a cop out. When people do that, that's a cop out. It's a cop out to appeal to their laziness, because they they think by mentioning white man or white people or European uh, book or author or information or whatever that that's supposed to trigger something in you. Uh, an emotional button to embrace what they're saying and you ignore it and you can't do that because reality just like the, sh the sun shines on everybody reality involves everybody truth involves everybody you could be um, black brown purple yellow cream pink whatever and what that does is look at reverse of that if you if you buy into the white man, this, that, and the third, in terms of how people use that, then what it does, it sets you up to accept everybody who's brown skin, 
as being all wise, right, and exact. As if brown skinned people can't be wrong. And so that's a that's a that's a vulnerability that we that we open ourselves to. And that's what allows these brown skinned people to fool you. Because in your mind, psychologically, you say, okay, the white man is the enemy. The white man will lie to us. I don't trust the white man, but I gotta trust my brother because I'm pro-black, they're pro-black, and blah, blah, blah. And nah, see, science don't work like that. Science is a science does its best to go above and beyond likes and dislikes, favoritisms and unfavoritism. Now you do have elements that that uh, get involved because human beings perform science, so so you can't totally elev- uh, eliminate those elements. But science itself, like I said, is self-correcting, and eventually it will be weeded out. You could be as racist as you as you want as a scientist, but eventually your racism in your science will be revealed because that's how science works. That's one of the that's one of the um, safety protocols that science offers us is that eventually that racism will bubble up to the top like cream you know you understand so so later for that so people got to stop using that as an excuse not to read and research you know oh, that's another thing but uh, i see i see someone ask the question so so do we just not ignore people who repeatedly bring up old arguments um See, like I said, it's tricky. We we have to understand the um, we have to understand that not everybody matures at the same time. So that's a given. Now, but what we can do, if if you find yourself in an argument with somebody who is not competent in the in the subject matter that that they're trying to argue, you you know, at first try to help them out. Help them out, point them in the right direction, give them some titles or some books to read, get them some authors' names, share the information you know off the top of your head, whatever, whatever it is that you do, uh, have, a, have enough care and concern to do that. But now, this is where the difference comes in. If you did that, you took your time out to do that, and you find them coming back and coming back with the same stuff, and it doesn't look like they, they took your advice or did any kind of research that you suggested, and stuff, then you know you make your own judgment at that point. You like, all right, well, look, listen, you you do you, I'm gonna do me, you know, because at a certain point, what happens is people cause you to work for them, and there'll be a distraction to your progress, you know, as a as a growing, as a maturing person yourself. And so we can't, we gotta be, we gotta be mindful of energy vultures, people who just drain you, drain, drain, drain. That's all they do. So, but you got to make up that judgment. I think everybody, everybody has a certain threshold that they themselves set. Like I have a high tolerance, um, but it's, you know, over the years it's diminished because, you know, uh, you know, I used to be able to sit there and argue with somebody for quite a while, uh, but that has definitely shrunk. I don't, I don't, I don't do it. I see, you know, the older you get, the less tolerance you have. So hopefully that kind of, um address that and adrian says is there anything in writing that can slightly indicate how the Merkut uh were built um by Merkut, yeah i guess he's talking about the pyramids um there's not something that will give you an instructions on how they're built and not to not to um deviate like i'm dodging your question but i do want to say something that's that's just like your question that people don't think about so i'm just trying to give you something else to think about um basically nowhere in egyptian literature do the egyptians themselves explain the deities like laid out like that the meanings of their names and things like that you basically have to figure it out by way of context and by way of pulling pulling all the resources together in the literatures to really understand why the deities are named, what they're named, their functions, and what their names mean, and what they stand in. What is the reality behind these different deities, these uh, Neturu, various different Neturu? And I only bring that up to come back to your question is, likewise, you won't find literature that will tell you 
Step one, the pyramids were built this way. This is what we did first. This is what we did second. This is what we did third. Um, but by looking at um, several, pulling all the resources from all of the literature, especially dealing with um, the laying of the pulling the core ceremonies of building temples and the mathematical, various different mathematical papyri and stuff like that, you can uh, deduce certain things about the pyramids and how they were built. But, but if you, if you're asking, was there, you know, it's like, there's a blueprint and, 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 you know, a list of things of steps that was taken and stuff like that, not to my knowledge, you know, and like I said, I say not to my knowledge. Um, there may be something out there that we don't know about yet, or that I personally don't know about. And I'll be more than happy to, um, to look at something. If somebody finds something, you know, hit me up, inbox me, put me on speed dial. <laughs> so just want to it says y'all better start a chemotology higher learning system Egyptology is dead <laughs> um, yeah chemotology I think you know we you know people use chemotology versus Egyptology to kind of make that distinction between um, the, the early European uh, writings and literature and characterization of Egyptian phenomena versus the African, because you got see Sheikh and the Giap has really set the bar. He's 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 the standard, um, you know, and that's why he's the very pivotal 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 point in our um, academic journey about African phenomena. In terms of you know academics and stuff, scholar scholarly works, he set the bar. We can't go backwards. We got to take what Sheikh Anta Giab at his level, and even do better. We can't go backwards. We can't do anything. Uh, we can't backtrack. You know, and that's one of the things that people do. They 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 use the title chemistology versus Egyptology. All right, so I'm I'm just going through the um. The comments and if y'all if any of y'all see a comment that you want to read um go for it because I, I know we've been on two hours now just about so kind of wrap it up um I'm, I'm, I'm don't see anything pretty much else uh, um i heard a little about about the different natural assigned to different parts of our body do you know of this uh yes that's uh adrian asked the question um, yes. Now th that's a very long discussion, but let me just tell, let me just say something, um, very brief that the Neturu have multiple simultaneous, um, functions or they represent multiple things simultaneously. Okay. And the best I can do now to, without getting into a very long conversation is look at excuse me look at the Neturu as categorical labels okay think of a think of a file cabinet and picture a file cabinet with that have several file drawers okay so I'm talking about file cabinet drawer which where you got several drawers and what's in a file cabinet drawer is usually folders and within the folders are, are individual papers. So you got papers within a folder and the folders within the file cabinet drawer and the file cabinet drawer is within the whole cabinet. All right. So now the nature rule would represent categorical labels that will go on the outside of these drawers. And that particular nature rule or nature or nature would govern whatever's inside the drawer. So these Neturu has have a certain sphere that they represent, a sphere of reality that they represent that's on multiple levels. So the sphere of reality that they represent could be cosmic, it could be uh, personal, it could be society, dealing with on a society level, a very personal level, or a cosmic level, and other levels in between that I'm not mentioning. So when you ask me that question, uh, different nature are assigned body parts, but that's true. Some of them are, but but also so many other things, and and that will be part of their jurisdiction. So each nature will have a jurisdiction. We're speaking in legal terms, 
um, a netra would govern a certain sphere of jurisdictional influence and whatever's under that influence that's what they will govern so I'm gonna give you an example um, Heru a lot of people are familiar with Heru so I like to use Heru as an example Heru is known to be the patron deity over kingship all the kings in Egypt were known as, in some form or fashion to be a personification or up under the deity of Heru the Falcon all right now so what does that mean in terms of what I'm saying and I'm and I'm trying to be brief right now and we can have another discussion about this but Heru as a deity has the jurisdiction over the uh, personal concept or personal um, um, aspect of our being of circumspection our, our ability to coordinate different moving parts to work together as one part and to coordinate that and we have to have the ability to circumspect in order to do that so out of that principle you'll you'll understand why Heru is is the deity over kings because the function of a king over the kingdom is to operate and coordinate and manage the all the individual smaller moving parts within your kingdom so the king is at the top of the um, hierarchy the political hierarchy uh, within or the society uh, hierarchy and then he has a visor and then the visor will have governors and each each area called a uh, gnome in Greek Greek but it's called a sapat in Rodney Kemet each gnome had a governor but the king, everybody answered to the king. So it's like a trickle, trickle down economic type of uh, system, a trickle down system that was going on. And so the king has to have the ability to administrate, manage, and coordinate all those different parts and be responsible for that. And so Heru represents the aspect within every individual being, you and I, our ability to do that as well. We, we, we manage our life like that. So that aspect within our psyche, within our spirit, because the word spirit and the word psych are pretty much interchangeable. The aspect in our psyche that gives us the ability to do that is governed by Heru. So when you say, do the some of the Neturu govern, you know, have different body parts, stuff like that. Yes, the physical body parts, but so many, so much more, so much more. Heru will also represent the body part or the will, which was represented by the heart, the id, which is called the mind. All right, the the mind, and 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 our ability to circumspect is what is what secures the will, and so we call it min ib, and that's what's in my name. Min means stable, and it it is the it is the um, vertical stability, whereas jed is the perpendicular or the um, the uh, horizontal stability. You have min. And it and and Jed are, are both words that translate as stable or stability to stabilize something, but one is dealing with it two like slightly different aspects of stability. So we have min ib, which is the secure to secure the will. And min ib is another word for saying confident. Uh, because when you when you make your the will is the ability to choose. When you make choices based on a conviction a conviction like you are totally convinced 1000 percent sure about something then you are secure in your decision and in, in your choice that is a strong will that so so it's a it's an idiom for confidence for um now used negatively it could be also an idiom for um for uh what do you call it um stubbornness minib can also mean stubborn in a negative way because that means you, that means your your choice is immovable. That means that you you know you're stubborn. Like no matter what you see, you're gonna stay you're gonna stay stuck right there, you know. So it could be it could be an idiom for um, stubbornness, or it could be an idiom for having a very very secure foundation upon which you make your choices. And so a king has to have all of that. And that, that that's how come a king a king in order for a king or any anybody that's in charge of anything there has to be a backdoor mechanism for for people to save them from themselves because it's easy to flick the switch from from 
being positively used to negatively used. And a king or a person in charge can be arrogant, can become arrogant and can become stubborn to the point where they don't rule correctly or control things correctly. So you, you may have that boss at your, at your job that that um, uh, abuses their powers, so to speak, and things like that. So anyway, I don't want to run on, but I'm just giving you that one example where Heru comes into play. Heru is the um, is the deity that governs. Just give me examples that governs the will, governs kingship, governs the ability to manage, administer, and um, um, coordinate a lot of different parts into one to make them work sufficiently and effectively. And that's that's the job of a king. So Heru will govern kingship, and Heru was given the crown of kingship through his father, um, not his direct father, but uh, through Geb. Geb gave him the crown of the living and and Usir the crown or lordship or rulership over the Duat, the dead. So that's the division. So father and son, son was uh, to govern the um, conscious, the awake, the people who are living. And Usir governs the unconscious or subconscious and or those who are dead. All right, because remember, sleep is the sister to death. So when you're asleep, you're in the duat as well. But like I said, see, this is gonna get, this go this can, this can take the conversation <laughs> onto a whole nother thing. But it's this kind of things that we have. See, this is the kind of stuff that we should be talking about. So to know how to how to apply it. How does it apply to us? Like how how does Heru Heru? Uh, you know, what's the practical usage of of us understanding about Heru? You know what I mean? Are these just some deities that's, that's out there that we should worship? But anyway, all right, so we've been on for two hours, and I don't want to uh, make this run on. So anybody else have any closing um, closing words? Uh, Sin Coffee just walked in. What up, Sin Coffee? Hotel, hotel, family. All right, hotel, hotel. Boy, Kofi, you came at the tail end, boy. I, I know, boy, I know if, I know if Kofi... Said, Kofi, we can go another two hours with Kofi on board. <laughs> but um, yeah, we 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 closing out. Uh, we've been on two hours, and um, you know we we could do this again. Uh, just want to do something a little bit different. Um, and you know we we call Fridays Freestyle Fridays, but at the same time we don't want to become enablers, like because people who followed our Freestyle Fridays, um, you know. The participation is appreciated, man. We 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 want more people to participate and everything like that. But we, at the same time, we don't want to become enablers. So we don't want, in other words, we don't want you to um, look at you know, chime, you know, hang out with us on a freestyle Friday, but then don't take it further. And that's why I encourage everyone to sign up for the class. I I'm starting a new class group. In two weeks time, in the, in the beginning of August, I'm going to set it for August 1st, you know, the beginning of August. So I'm going to give some time for people to spread the word. Those who are interested, sign up. It's a 12-week study course, interactive. So I wrote a book called The uh, Be uh, Beginner's Introduction to Meta Nature, and I use it as a textbook. I wrote it as a textbook. It's basically a consolidation of beginning beginners material put into one book in a orderly way to where we could walk through that book and by the time you finish after 12 weeks time you will be able to transliterate and translate basic egyptian inscriptions and that i guarantee you okay because i i um teach the course and i interact so it's a live interactive uh course all right and so i'm starting a new group um for August, the beginning of August. So you can go to the website. All the all of the links are inside the description of this video. Should be there. Yeah. It's in the it's in the actually the second um in the second sentence in our description. All right. Sign up for the course. You can inbox me on Facebook. Inbox anybody on the Seshu Mani Metal Nature um Facebook if you if you're friends with, with me or anybody else on Facebook for more information or email. All right. Also, um, anybody has any question about the language being deciphered? I'm still showing on my screen, I think, the um, the book. 
Uh, has the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered? A rebuttal to Walter Williams. Just the book on the left. That's our book we wrote last year addressing that question. But not only do we address the question, but we also we wrote it in two different par two parts. Part one is giving a lot of information on the foundation, some basic things that you have to know in order to to see what we're saying when we rebuttal Professor Williams' claims. And his book is on the right. So in all fairness, when we advertise our book, because it's addressing his book, I always like to show them together, all right, to, because we have respect for the elder, uh, Walter Williams, and he wrote a good book called The Historical Origin of Christianity. Now, we're not rebuttaling his entire book, only the, only the claim when it came to the hieroglyphs, all right, which is only five pages in his book in the appendix, and we ad we're addressing it. But like we asked for support for our book, you know, support the elder and um, get his book so you'll be able to see, you know, some other things that he's talking about. All right. But get the book, spread the word for people to get the book, um, our book. And, you know, people who, who, who may have the, um, the question about decipherment or whatever the case is, we explain how a writing system works, you know, when we, and we summarize a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the information because otherwise you have to dig in and research. And a lot of people don't want to take the time out to do that. Or may not have the time. They may want to, but they may not have the time because you got to work, deal with your your family, your, your children, and that's understood. So we put it together for everybody in that book. Get the book. All right. Um, what else do we have? Uh, I, I already mentioned the uh, the class, and that's um, the interactive uh, class. You can go to the website. It's there, mdw-ntr.com. Go to the website. And look under courses, and it explains it all. There's a there's a course for interactive. There's a course for self study. Let's say you don't want to interact with uh, other classmates or me or a teacher, and you want to learn on, learn on your own, but you have the book. You can do so. Now, what this does is that it allows you to um, become certified. I give out cert certification or certificates for those who pass the course. And what that certification is a testament of, it's a confirmation that you have gained proficiency at a beginner's level. And so you have my stamp of approval and others who, along with me. Okay. And then at that level, now you, we can, you know, confidently say, hey, you are competent at a beginner's level. All right. And that's what the certif certification does. Now, it's not accredited with, you know, any uh, college or anything like that. But just like um, everybody who teaches Sesh Metal Nature, uh, you have Dr. Riketi Amin, myself, uh, Benoche Montgomery, and others. I'm just, I just mentioned us three because I know we do it um, via online, you know, online. But other people are, are teaching it in other areas as well. Um, but... A, a, a lot of us, we give certificates because we want people to know that, okay, you have accomplished this goal and this is where you stand and stuff like that. So that's what that does. Now, if you take this, the self-study without the interactive um, aspect with me or other classmates, you can still become certified. I give the same test to those who want to learn on their own. You get the book, you go through the book, you, you complete all of the um, quizzes and you take the final exam, which is 100 questions, and you, you, you um, do the essay, and you turn that in, and I will look at it and everything like that the same way. And I will, um, and you, you can be certified that way. So either way, the options are there. My, and I'm just saying this because it's all on the website. So for more information, you can go to the website. All right. And, um, oh, as far as the price goes, it's 12 weeks long, uh, which is three months. And you will learn how to transliterate and translate. And the price is one hundred dollars, all right, which is very, 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 very reasonable compared to others out there that are teaching that are charging a whole lot more money. Matter of fact, I've seen one class in in the UK, um, Emicat. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that particular class was a, was was twenty five hundred dollars. No, I think it was um twenty five hundred or two thousand uh, British pounds. Oh, okay, right, right, two hundred pounds, to about three thousand or something dollars. I'm not sure. Right, two thousand pounds, which yeah, like is is more in in um 
in dollars. Now, to that credit, to that person's credit, who's who's charging that much, uh, they teach the they teach the class uh, a little bit about the language, but they also teach some other things in there. But if you really looked at it, you you know it'll blow your mind at at, at how much you're spending for what what's offered, you know. Um, but I'm not trying to advertise for them, but but my point is that $100 is very reasonable 12 weeks and you know cuz my my point is to get people up to speed at the beginner's level because when you really really get into it is the next phase is when we start studying the grammar and I'll be offering that in the winter time starting winter time I have to complete the textbook first so I'm still working on that and I'll be publishing the book uh, and starting the course at the same time so I hope to have that out by the winter time and I'm and I'm and I'm being vague and saying winter winter because I don't want to give it a specific date because, you know, that's just not how this uh, how this publishing works. <laughs> I, I've learned that, you know, set a date and, you know, you know, it's, it's hard to deal with that. So I just want to say the wintertime, give myself a nice uh, season goal. All right. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly add um, that, um, you know, I think um, the price is, um, you know, the fee is very reasonable. Um, the one that is offered at, um, uh, you know, on, the, on our website, because, um, you know, just when you think about it, when you're dealing, when you're learning any any language, if you're learning French or if you're learning um, Spanish or German, you know, um, the prices usually are much, uh, much more costly than that. And then when you're learning languages that um, deal with different scripts, then it gets extra costly. So um, just looking at the price that is being offered, I think is very, very reasonable. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And like I said, I, the, the price that set $100 is a testimony to the fact that I am not interested in breaking anybody's pockets. I'm not, it's not no uh, get rich uh, type of thing. I'm not making this a hustle whatsoever, but time definitely has to be compensated for. So it's a very, very big sacrifice on my part and a compromise on my part to have it at a price to where it's, it's very reasonable and it also accommodates for the time that that's taken out to to um, go through the course with a group of people. So I think it's very reasonable, um, especially when you compare it to others. Now, the grammar course is going to be um, more, much more intense and um, a different story. And I'll, I'll be working that out and be announcing that, you know, in the future. But I encourage people to get the book, the beginner's book. Um, you can read it on your own. Like I said, you can study on your own, walk through it, do the, do the exercises within it, go through it from chapter to chapter, and you'll be good. That's what you're seeing on the screen, the beginner's book. And like I said, also get the uh, rebuttal book because there's information in there that complements this beginner's book. Uh, things that were that's not included in the beginner's book that's in the rebuttal book. And they're both valuable. All right. You need that. Um, and share it. Spread the word if anybody who's who's. Um, who you think is interested in learning the language. Now, just real quick before we end, what's the benefit of learning the language? And I'll just give you one good um, rundown. And it's basically uh, within the introduction of both books. And I'll just read it. Um, actually, it's on the back. It's on the back cover of the beginner's book. And so... This is a good this is a good summary of one of the reasons, one of the advantage advantages of learning the language. All right. So I'll just read it. It's on the back cover of the book. It says language is the oldest living witness to history. Language can be considered the DNA of culture. It contains the state of mind and the worldview of the people. Without learning the language of a culture or group being studied, there can be no meeting of the mind. We've often heard the phrase. Let the ancestors speak, and in order to hear and understand, we must know their language. This is the inspiration behind the making of this book, which is to provide the basic tools and means to enter the world of ancient Egypt and have a meeting of the minds with the illustrious civilization, society, culture, and people responsible for contributing so much to the world, whether we realize it or not. All right, and that's basically a summary of why the why i've taken time out and have really pushed learning the language but also the bigger picture is that egypt is being um used as a resource by everybody but us and egypt 
everybody, everybody on the planet can attest to the greatness of ancient Egypt. So much so that people get sick and tired of people talking about his greatness. They, they think talking about Egypt's greatness is to say Egypt is the first civilization, uh, the oldest civilization on the planet. Um, the first African this and first African that and that everybody's from Egypt and everything like that. People want to go the ro romanticizing route with it and not stick to the fact of what Egypt really is. It is um, a genius powerhouse. It's a, it's a storehouse of genius. And everybody's tapping into that genius except us. The only way you can tap into it is to learn the language because the genius of the people are contained in their language, which is the DNA of their culture. And so they recorded everything. It's one of the few ancient uh, civilizations that have um, a wealth of surviving records of how they thought, what what went into their genius, how did you know what what caused the why did they people want to know how they built the pyramids, but why did they build them? Why they built temples? Why did they do what they did? And why were they so good at doing what they did? First of all, how did they unify over a 4,000, roughly a 4,000 mile geographical territory along a river b before there was any long distance communication, no quick communication, no way to synchronize thoughts and stuff like that? How were they able to unify such a large territory of people back so long ago and keep them unified for, for roughly 3,000 years? That's a miracle in and of itself. And you best believe we better tap into that genius, that that whatever ingenuity that that caused that to happen. And we can only do it by way of this language. So that's the advantage of learning the language. And that's what needs to be uh, pushed uh, with everybody. That's one of the benefits. People want to know, you know, can learn language, put money on my table or um, put food on, put uh, money in my pocket, food on my table. And it's no direct correlation with that. It's way bigger than that and beyond that. Food and money are necessities, but they're on the surface. What we're dealing with is what goes into the mind. Because remember, everybody's action is preceded by thoughts. And if you, if you control the thoughts of people, you, you indirectly control their actions. And so in order to regain our mind, we have to um, tinker and, 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 and lift the hood up and tinker with our mind. And everything will follow. And I, and I believe that uh, George Clinton says it best, Parliament Funkadelic. He said, free your mind and your ass will follow. That's a, that's a good uh, metaphoric way of saying, you know, you free your mind, all of your actions will follow and we will be free. You know, basically what he's saying. By the way, I'm a, I'm a Parliament Funketeer, um, you know. I guess I could give George George Clinton uh, quotes for days, but anyway. So anyway, I, I'm 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 done. And uh, anybody has anything to um, add to that? And if not, or along with it, um, Sonnet Emicat, if you can um, close us out. Um. Yeah. Hotep. Uh. <laughs> tip. Now you just walked in late, but um. Yeah, so I'll just close out by saying um, dua um, for the, you know, this enlightening conversation and for those that, are, you know, shared their two cents of both on the panel and on on the chat. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a legitimate question, you know, are we stuck? And, um, you know, just before I close out, you know, I'd just like to give more props to, to this issue uh, uh, crew, you know, just call us the Sishu. I know uh, the name gets a little bit difficult sometimes. Sishu, my anime, the natural, but if it's too long, just say the Sishu or the Sishu crew. But yeah, I like to give more props to the Sishu. Um, you know, some of the things that we've talked about um, is, um, you know, um, you, you know, aligning yourself with, um, you know, people who can teach you something. And I know Anko always talks about, um, you know, if you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, you know, something along, along the lines of leave the room or get out. You know, and, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why we formed, um, you know, this issue. Um, I know the brothers, you know, coming in and, you know, and with the knowledge that the brothers had, I was, you know, um, able to, you know, propel my learning. You know, so you want to align yourself with um, with a proper team, you know, like you want to be able to, you know, have people who have, you know, who are more humble, you know, and uh, and have um, have something to teach and are willing to teach and also 
willing to learn together with you. So, um, you know, with this issue, um, you know, that's what we do. You know, we have, um, you know, we from from the last, um, I think it's two years or so. I mean, we've been, you know, from those who have been watching us, you've seen, you know, how much growth we've um, we've gone through. And just like we said it before, you know, uh, from, you know, when we had the debate on Cameron trial, you know, I guess most of us, like I hadn't even started a class. I didn't even know anything about the language per se on how to read anything with the language. But, um, you know, just putting in our work, you know, that did actually help. So you don't want to be stuck, um, you know, just regurgitating the same things. You want to learn and, you know, and uh, just keep on learning. And that would actually help if you're actually with a team or you align yourself with a group of people that are actually helping. And I just looked at my Facebook um you know, a timeline, you know, you have the t uh, Facebook memory like you talked about. I remember um, it was, I think it was last month <clears throat> that I had that one of those memories where it was um, last month, two years um, last month, I actually um, purchased the book and hadn't started the classes yet. And uh, I, uh, on my Facebook, um, you know, post, I was actually um, trying to get um, some people, you know, trying to uh, form a study group so I could actually um, have people around my area to learn the language with. And um, I didn't know that, you know, I would actually be, you know, find myself with a team of people after that, you know, that uh, that you see me now with. So again, much props to this issue. And also, also you know, what we talked about, um, you know, at the base of it all, we have to, um, you know, cultivate good character. And with this issue, that's those are, you know, that's one of the main um, thing that we, um, you know, we 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 um, insist to have. And you know, like we say, we are also in the learning process as well. We are not perfect. But one of the things that we want to do is have, um, you know, display good character. And, um, you know, the other one is to be proficient. So these two things are the things that are lacking. And these are the two things that make people stuck, you know, and always, um, you know, regurgitating the same things. You know, um, there's no good character. Ego takes over, you know, and nobody wants to learn from the next person. So good character is a must. And then proficiency, you know, this we, we, uh, we have, um, you know, uh, made the commitment to be proficient in the language, such middle nature. You know, and um, I know we have our curriculum that we've talked about, um, you know, a lot. And you see even at the curriculum at what point we are right now in, you know, through our two year journey and how much we still need to, you know, to go through. And we are willing to actually accept that this takes time and we are going to be putting in the time. So, um, you know, no microwave stuff. We're here for the long run, you know, to go through all the different stages, the three stages of the pyramid and, you um, and that is key. So, you know, long plan, you know, we have to be able to, um, you know, um, make plans and actually accept long plans and be patient with all of that. So this is part of, of what we do at this issue. And, you know, and we hope that some more people will actually be able to join, like St. June was talking about, um, you know, it can get, you know, what we need is more people also, you know, being proficient because um, few people can't take us that far, but we need more people. So, uh, you know, part of also the, you know, um, the the initiative to actually have these shows was to share with people our um, our learning journey and obviously um, to, you know, because we didn't have most of that while we started out. So um, when, you know, f for that, we get more people to actually see that, you know, this is something that can be done. We are doing it and they can see us in the process of doing it. So obviously, um, you know, it would be good to have more people um you know, or who are interested to be part of the conversation and the progress with the language, you know, to actually, um, you know, take the time or, you know, or be willing to actually come in and learn the language because we do need more people, um, you know, in, in, in this field. So I just wanted to add that. And obviously, once again, major, 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 major props to wa do wa to the Sishu um, crew. So um, with that, I'd like to say, um, you know, get an affair to those um you know on the night time and back on the fair to those in the morning time and um shame him hotel go in peace